kind of structure, the bigger it is, it needs to have more architectural elements in it. It, means it needs more structural elements to hold it up. Um, and so you have to be much more thoughtful about structure, and narrative normally produces structure. It creates characters, uh, it creates a problem or establishes a problem or a conflict that is going to be confronted by the characters that you've selected to carry the tale. You can then peel off into explanation, you can peel off into history, you can peel off into these other areas, but the, the point is once you establish the narrative flow of something, it gives you um, the, the skeleton of a building that's big enough to hold up the whole narrative structure. You know, I have a, a, a rule of trying to avoid what I call the kitchen sink story, where you just start to throw everything into it and you talk to everybody who's a source on it, because there's no, um, um, central character, central personality, central issue around which everything coheres. You have to be really strategic about making a story entertaining enough that people will do the work of, of learning the science or learning more than they thought they wanted to learn or th they thought they needed to learn in order to understand the, the complexity of the story. Many. <laughs> I am a compulsive rewriter and I, I do write on a computer, but then I print it out. I like the pen in my hand. You just see the words on the page and you kind of see the, the spatial arrangement of the words and paragraphs in a different way when you're, when you're actually with pen in hand looking at a piece of paper. There is a little bit more premium uh, placed on the online narrative to get to the point by the first paragraph almost. And that's certainly the editorial suggestions you get and people get. Um, I kind of like stories that unfold in a um, slow manner. There's an excellent example in the current issue of The New Yorker, as a matter of fact. It's, a, it's the this story that begins about uh, losing things, and you think it's a cognitive story about memory, and it's actually about human loss and personal loss. And you don't know that until you're almost halfway through the story, you know what it's about. Um, I don't think a story like that could exist purely online. You know, storytelling uh, sometimes relies on patience and withholding of information as a device, and that maybe that piece of the online stuff, there may not be that degree of patience. We always talk about this with students, is are they exposed to the um, community experience of the newsroom? There's a very distinct camaraderie and collegiality that develops in that environment that you don't always find in an, an online setting. Whereas it was very hard for me and maybe you to get that first or second job in journalism because it was just very competitive. Everything is wide open now. You can write for almost any website almost immediately uh, when you're interested in trying to do it. And if the work is good enough, you keep doing it. The economic point is the big issue about how getting paid for it. So I tell students, you know, the opportunity is there, seize it. You know, what I actually do is I kind of gravitate back to things that I've written about before, but after a long lag, like five or ten years. So where is this field now? So for example, I wrote a book about um, um, kind of regenerative medicine and stem cell research and this idea that you could regenerate organs and this whole idea of life extension. And that came out over 10 years ago. You know, I like to circle back now and sort of see where that stands, uh, what the issues are. There were questions that were unresolved 10 years ago, how have they been addressed? Uh, that's the kind of thing I like to do. So.